And this conversation series was developed as a means for the lab to contribute to the urgent need to develop new models and approaches to addressing the interrelated sustainability crises affecting the world today. Um, an archive of these conversations is with some of the world's leading sustainability pioneers can be found on the lab's website. So tonight, um, we shall focus on an urgent need for change with Sir Robert Watson. Sir Robert is a British chemist who has worked on atmospheric science issues, including ozone depletion, global warming, and paleoclimatology since the 1980s. So most recently, Sir Robert um, was the lead author on the 2021 UN report entitled Making Peace with Nature. We'll have a chance to hear some more about his work and his background in a minute, but I just wanted to add that Sir Robert was knighted for his government service in 2012. And we could not be more honored and delighted that he's joined us here this evening. Thank you, Sir Robert, for being here. Um, and now I'm going to turn things over to the founding director of the Sustainability Laboratory, Dr. Michael Benelli. Hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for joining us. And of course, hello, Bob. Thank you so much for doing it with us. Uh, so please, Bob, let, let's start by you having uh, introduced yourself to our audience uh, and kind of highlighting your professional career stuff. Sure. Um, I did a, a mass, um, I did an undergraduate degree and a PhD at Queen Mary College London. My PhD was in atmospheric chemistry, reactions of chlorine and bromine that turn out to be very important for understanding the stratospheric ozone layer and why we humans were depleting it. I then did a postdoc at Berkeley University in Maryland and then set up my own research group at the Jet Propulsion Lab always working on the chemistry relevant to the atmosphere. After that, in 1980, I became a manager at NASA. I, I started to manage research programs. And following my stint at NASA managing a research program, I became a science advisor, first in the uh, Clinton-Gore White House, then at the World Bank, and then at the British government, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Now, in parallel to that job, or these jobs, I then started to actually work on international ozones. I developed the very first international assessment on stratospheric ozone in 1980, and actually have actually chaired at least 10 international assessments on stratospheric ozone. And since then, I've chaired the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, an international panel on agriculture, and most recently, Making Peace with Nature, that synthesized all of these assessments over the last 10 years. That's amazing. You, you really certainly have a broad overview of all the issues that are facing us today. But before, again, we jump into the content, uh, maybe we can uh, ask you to present yourself in a more uh, a personal way, that kind of the making of, uh, of Sir Robert. <laughs> What, what are the things that inspired you along the way, why you chose your science, uh, key milestones, education, mentors, etc. Well, I was brought up by a single mother and she viewed a very working class mother actually in Essex, England. And she viewed it was crucially important that I get a, got a good education, which gave me opportunities in life. Uh, my philosophy in life has been very simple. Always stretch yourself. Never be in your own comfort zone. So every time an opportunity came for a different type of job or a different challenge, I'd always jump at it. My view was you could only learn uh, by being outside your comfort zone, but not ridiculously outside your comfort zone. I also realized when I did my PhD, um, none of my other friends worked in my field. Uh, most didn't go to university. They were all extremely bright people, extremely bright, but many went into banking, uh, stock exchange, et cetera, much younger. Um, but, you know, I could talk about my chemistry, but it really was very academic. Once I found that the research I was doing had relevance to society, 
understanding stratospheric ozone depletion, understanding our human influence on climate, our human influence on biodiversity. Once I understood that, that opened up all the doorways so I could contribute to the science policy. Nice. So what pushed me was always be outside your comfort zone and being at that science policy interface has been absolutely an incredible experience for the last 40 years. Wonderful. Uh, so we have really a packed content tonight. So let's bring out, let's jump straight into the content and let's bring out the presentation. Yeah, so what I'm going to talk about today is exploring the sustainability challenge and how we have a real challenge in front of us. The first thing that we'd want to uh, look at is the, tell us a little bit more about the global assessments. I'm sure some of the audience are not familiar. What are they, who, how they were brought about, who do, do, done them and for whom they intended, et cetera? Yeah, in my opinion, these are incredibly important. We've got international assessments on stratospheric ozone, on climate, the IPCC, on biodiversity, IPBES. We've had them on issues such as agriculture. In my opinion, they're crucial. Issues of stratospheric ozone depletion, climate change, biodiversity loss, are all global issues. Therefore, we need all countries of the world to work together. And if they're gonna to work together, they need a common understanding of what we know and what we don't know. So these assessments typically are intergovernmental. They're independent of any UN agency or multilateral environment agreement. They're prepared by the world's absolute best uh, experts. They're geographically balanced, intellectually balanced and gender balanced. People participate in their individual capacity. They don't represent a government or an NGO or a private sector company. They're nominating the whole process is open and transparent. They're evidence-based. They must be credible, transparent, legitimate, and owned by all relevant decision makers, governments, private sector, the public at large, which means they always work with very well-defined principles and procedure. To, be, to provide the knowledge that you need for national and international decision-making, they need to be multi-thematic environmental, technological, social, economic. They have to look at multiple scales from local to national to regional to global. We need to look back a hundred years. How did we get to where we are today? And what could plausibly be the future? So we typically look another 50 or a hundred years into the future. We've got to realize, and I'll talk about it later, we can't look at these so-called environmental issues in isolation. They're related to the development challenges. They're, de they're related to policy processes. We've also got to recognize it's not what I would call just Western science that matters. We have to recognize we've got diverse worldviews and diverse value systems. And therefore we need to incorporate things such as in, uh, indigenous and local knowledge into our assessments. And basically what we need to do is we need to synthesize all the knowledge is out there and say to governments and the private sector, all of the state, what do we know? What is still unknown? What's uncertain? And what are the implications of uncertainty for policy formulation? It's also crucial we assess the social, environmental, and economic impact of both action and inaction. So that in a nutshell is what these assessments, they're normally conducted with hundreds of scientists from all over the world. Taking a, a bird's eye view of this incredibly complex uh, scenarios building, uh, what, what is the kind of the most significant message that emerged uh, from that? And what are the major trends that drive the issues that we need to face? Let me make a series of points here. First, we have four, at least four, major global issues that threaten human well-being of both this and future generations. Human-induced climate change, the loss of biodiversity and the degradation of nature due to human activities, land degradation, air, water and land pollution. The key message is, and it'll be a theme throughout my talk, all of these issues are interconnected. They affect each other 
and they need to be addressed together. And therefore, you can't think of climate change independent of loss of biodiversity, land degradation or pollution. So the challenge is to understand the interactions. The next slide basically summarizes where we are. The Earth's finite capacity to support us humans is being degraded and we're surpassing the capacity. The UN Secretary General has called on the world to end a senseless and suicidal war and make peace with nature. And that's where the title of that last document I co-chaired, Making Peace with Nature, built on the Secretary General. But also we have to realize that as we've developed, we've caused environmental damage. The challenge now is effectively not just how do we transform nature, which has helped on economic development, but unfortunately it is destroying nature. We have to transition to transforming our relationship with nature. So in the last uh, 50 years, our economy has grown about fivefold. Trade has probably gone up tenfold. Population has doubled to about 8 billion people, but we still have an inequitable world. Over 1 billion people are poor and over nearly a billion are probably go to bed hungry every night. And COVID certainly helped, didn't help the situation. We're also disposing of waste matter. So we really have a big challenge. We've exploited nature for economic growth, but now we're in trouble and we now have to transform ourselves and that's what the rest of my talk will be about. The next slide then talks about what are the factors? Well, the big, the big factors are the way we use and produce energy and the way we use our land. This simply shows you what's happened literally in the last hundred or more years, actually uh, 200 years on energy production. But the part to focus on mainly is since 1960. In other words, the last 50 or 60 years. As you can see, our production of energy has gone up tremendously, and it's primarily uh, biofuels, uh, and that is what not modern biofuels, but people in poor countries cutting down the trees and using the, the trees as biomass. But the big change is the way we've used coal, oil, and gas, fossil fuels. They're the big driver of how we've produced our energy with a small amount of hydropower, a small amount of nuclear, and a small amount of what I call modern renewable energy, and that is wind and solar. And I'll talk about the implications in a minute. The next slide says that we humans have drastically transformed our land and our oceans. Three quarters of our ocean land has been transformed. The ice free land has been converted into monoculture agriculture, monoculture plantations, cities, roads, other infrastructure. One quarter of that land radically transformed. And our projections are by 2050, only 10% of the ice free land will be anything what we would call near natural. Now, it's our, man, our use of energy, fossil fuel energy, and our land use practices that have actually led to a major change in the emissions of greenhouse gases. If you look at this slide, you can see a drastic increase in the use of pesticides, fertilizers, and just the chemical industry in emerging economies, the pink line has drastically increased from the year 2000. So we have a world that is relying on chemicals, but they're changing drastically. And the question is, what are the human health and environmental issues of this drastic increase in the use of chemicals? And I'll touch upon that in the talk. This now does show what's happened to greenhouse gases since 1990, the last 30 years. And as you can see, they've increased significantly, about a 50% increase. This increase is predominantly fossil fuel carbon dioxide in light blue, but also methane, nitrous oxide, fluorinated gases, and an increase in methane and nit nitrous oxide and methane from land use change. Our agricultural practices, our forestry practices. These are actually led already to a world 
there's at least one degree, and I would say closer to 1.1, even 1.2 degrees Celsius, warmer than only 100 years ago. Precipitation patterns are changing all over the world. More floods, more droughts. Sea level, the is rate of, of sea level rise is accelerating. We're seeing more frequent intense extreme weather, heat waves, floods, droughts, wildfires, even more severe hurricanes. And all of this is threatening both people, i.e. through our food security, water security and nature. And I'll expand upon all these in a minute. This actually just shows you what's happened to temperature, global mean surface temperature. On the left hand side is the last 1000 years. Uh, in fact, 2000 years and what you can see from what's year one to about 1500, relatively stable. But on the right hand side, it shows what's happened since the industrial period that was kicked off in England in 1850. And what you see is we've had a significant increase in temperature, global mean surface temperature in the last, especially in the last 50 years. Well, when we try and simulate those changes in blue at the bottom, just by natural variability alone, changes in solar output, changes in volcanic activity, you get that blue shaded area and it does not simulate the observed black line that wiggles above. If you then try and have a, a climate model that incorporates both natural variability and human activity and increasing greenhouse gases, changing land albedo, changing aerosols in the atmosphere, you actually get that orangey line and is a very good simulation between the observed change in temperature and the theoretically calculated change. In other words, we cannot, we cannot simulate the observed change in temperature on natural phenomena alone. We humans are the dominant cause of that change. You know, many of those trends are often portrayed as separate, discrete phenomena. And there are obviously systemic linkages between them. You've already talked about the interconnectedness. Perhaps you can talk a little bit more about the linkages between those issues and how they relate to the UN work. The next slide, and actually many that will follow, this actually just is a schematic, which simply says that climate change affects land degradation and biodiversity. And I will expand upon that in later slides. But land degradation itself affects climate change and changes in biodiversity affect climate. So for example, when you have climate change, it drastically changes species. And you'll see in later slides how many species are threatened by climate change. Whole ecosystems like coral reefs, uh, uh, forests, wetlands are all affected by climate change. And later slides show this. Equally, biodiversity is both affected by climate change and affects climate change. And the same with land degradation. And they all affect human well-being. They all have a role to play in food security, water security, equity. And the, my following slides will go into more detail. So this is just a schematic that simply says you cannot look at the issues in isolation. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're not only environmental issues, and I'll talk about it in a minute. They're also development issues, and I'll expand upon that in a minute, basically. And so the key message here is we need to look at all the environmental emergencies and the development challenges together, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And that's what I'll expand upon. We need our international agreements on climate, on biodiversity, on land degradation, all to be coordinated. Uh, they're not independent of each other. Therefore, we need to make sure that the technologies, the policies, the behavior change we need to address climate change are consistent with addressing biodiversity, are consistent with addressing land degradation, and that we don't have unintended consequences, that something we do that is good for climate could potentially be bad for either biodiversity or land degradation or meeting the UN Sustainable Goals. So we have to work together 
at the national and global level. So when we talk about all these trends, uh, obviously they show us that something extraordinary and unusual has been happening only very recently, and mostly, as you mentioned, because of human activity. Uh, what, what are the real, the, the kind of underlying implication of those trends? Well, first, let me start with climate change. And this shows how it's not a simple environmental issue. Changes in climate affect food security, especially in developing countries. There might be a slight increase in food production in the uh, temperate and high latitude regions, although that will depend very much not only on changes in temperature, but changes in precipitation and soil moisture. But definitely in the tropics and subtropics, food security will be adversely affected. There's also going to be a real change in water security, both the quantity and the quality of water. As we already can see today, we're seeing heat waves, we're seeing floods, we're seeing droughts, and this is really having a significant effect on water security in many parts of the world. The perverse thing is the dry areas of the world will become drier, that is the semi-arid areas of the world, and the wet areas will become wetter but there will also be major seasonal changes. So having more rain will not necessarily be good. Having a lot less will badly affect many reasons. <coughs> Adverse effects on human health. Vector-borne diseases such as malaria and dengue will increase. Waterborne diseases such as cholera. Heat stress mortality. Uh, deaths from extreme weather events such as hurricanes, cyclones. And because we will actually have an adverse impact on agriculture. We will let there'll be a lack of nutritious food. So that will also have adverse health effects. Also sea level rise and riverine flooding will displace potentially hundreds of millions of people, especially affecting low lying deltaic areas such as Bangladesh, Egypt, parts of China. But it will very badly affect all the low-lying Pacific islands, uh, places like Tuvalu, the Maldives, will be badly affected by flooding, badly affected. <coughs> and what I'll talk about in a bit more detail, very adverse effects on nature. And what you'll hear in a minute, climate change is a major threat to nature, especially warm water coral reefs. That means to say we will have to adapt and be uh, resilient to current and projected climate change. Each of those histograms shows you what happens when you go from one degree to five degree Celsius changes. When you're in white, right at the bottom of each histogram, it means no measurable effect. So up to one degree Celsius, most of these systems, dry land, soil erosion, vegetation loss, tropical crop yield, most of them are not affected badly up to one degree. Then as you go from one to two degrees, you go to amber, and that means we're starting to see measurable adverse effects on each of those systems. As you go to light red, we're starting to see severe effect, adverse effects on each of those systems. And when you get to the purpley colored or very dark red, these are very severe. So what you can see, most of these terrestrial systems start to be affected just over one degree Celsius. They're already seeing moderate to high effects by two degrees Celsius, and they're starting to be very significant effects by the time you get to three degrees Celsius or more. So all of these systems are affected by climate change. On the left, warm water corals, then kelp forests. On average, these are a bit less affected, but you can see uh, if we do indeed get a temperature increase of three degrees Celsius, certainly warm water corals, kelp, kelp fast grasses, seagrass marrows uh, will all be adversely affected. And indeed, we've already lost or adversely affected 50% of warm water corals all over the world. And at one and a half degrees Celsius, which in my opinion and the evidence support we will pass during the decade of the 2030s, we will have effectively lost at least 90% of all water coal. 
And at two degrees Celsius, we lose 99% of warm water corals. Very, very sensitive ecosystem. This actually shows the impact on individual species, insects, birds, mammals, and plants. What will happen at one and a half degrees, two, 3.2, and 4.5? All species had their preferred climatic zone. And this shows when would 50% of those species lose their preferred geographic range? So for insects, even at 1.5 degrees, so 5% will lose their preferred range. At 2 degrees, 18%. At 3 degrees, almost 50. And at 4.5 degrees, over 65. And you'll see a similar pattern for birds, mammals, and plants. In other words, as temperature increases, all of these species are going to lose 50% of their climatically determined geographic range. Some will move a little, some will just die. Next slide. <coughs> okay, so what are the big drivers? And this shows the interactions beautifully. Well, the biggest driver for terrestrial ecosystem, the loss of biodiversity, is land use change followed by direct exploitation of plants and animals, followed by climate change, followed by pollution, invasive alien species in blue, and then some other factors. In freshwater systems, exactly the same pattern. And in marine systems, uh, the biggest is exploitation, and in particular, overfishing. So where, what do we know? One million of the world's eight million plants and animals, and that's an estimate, eight, eight million, one million are threatened with extinction over the next 100 to 200 years. Some in the next few decades, some in the latter half of this century, and some next century. The population sizes and the abundance of species are dropping significantly, and we're affecting ecosystems and their services, especially the regulating, so the regulation of climate, pollution, floods, and diseases all being adversely affected. Now, while climate change has not been the dominant driver to date, it is likely if we don't manage to control climate with the Paris Agreement, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, if we cannot limit climate change to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, climate change could well be the dominant driver of biodiversity loss in the coming decade. So now you can see climate change, biodiversity, pollution, all interdependent on each other. And this actually just shows this is the IUCN red list. This is where we got our information from that one million out of eight million species are threatened with extinction. If a particular uh, histogram is in green, it means that that particular species may not be predominantly affected, like bony fishing. Uh, birds, not at this moment in time, uh, highly at risk. If you go to yellow, however, they're vulnerable. Endangered is in orange and critically endangered is in red and black already extinct in the wild. Some of the species are in zoos around. Well, what can you see? Cyclads, 40% of cyclads are threatened with extinction. Over 20% of amphibians. 20% of dicots, 20% of conifers. These are the species most threatened. But mammals, 10%, not an insignificant number. In fact, very significant. So it was this sort of data that we used, which is very high quality data, to effectively project one out of eight species is potentially threatened. However, if we act now on climate change, biodiversity, pollution, we can save most of those species. So what are the implications of loss of biodiversity? Well, a loss of ecosystem services, a reduction in the provisioning of food, clean water, energy and medicines, a reduction, as I've already said, in regulating services, regulating climate, air, water, pollution, pollination, floods, droughts, pests and diseases, and a reduction in our cultural and educational experience, such as recreation, a sense of place. Most of us actually feel much more mentally relaxed when we walk by a river and hear it gurgling, 
walk in the forest and hear the birds singing, walking on the beach and hearing the waves crashing. So there's real mental health about what I call a green infrastructure. Very important that cities have parks, have allotments, a green city, a city that's blue with lakes and rivers gives you much more mental relaxation than pure cities of buildings and concrete. Says, and this is, I think, probably one of the most one of the most important sites. We can no longer think of climate change, loss of biodiversity, and land degradation as just environmentally. They're economic. Climate change, loss of bioland costs money. We, it loses economic performance. And in fact, the cost of inaction is far more than the cost of action. They're development issues, as I always said, food security, water security, poverty alleviation, they're security issues. Some parts of the world will become uninhabitable, either due to sea level rise, or they will just become even more parched than they are together. They're, but they're also social and ethical issues and moral issues. Uh, there are distributional issues. We in the North have caused most of the problems, but it's often people in the South in developing countries that are most affected. And you can say from an ethical and moral perspective, do we have a right to destroy nature, to change the Earth's climate? And all of these affect the sustainable development goals. And this shows you what I call the wedding cake. On the bottom is climate change and biodiversity loss. And I've already talked about what might happen with climate change and the loss of biodiversity. But these undermine, if we don't deal with climate change and loss of biodiversity, we actually won't, our cities will become far less sustainable. Uh, the, 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 the temperature in cities will make them that, and the pollution in cities will make them far less, far less habitable. I've already said, we will weaken food and water security. And that's that middle layer of the cake. And if indeed we can't deal with climate and biodiversity, and we do threaten food and water security, our cities become more unsustainable. We will not be able to address poverty. We will not be able to address the inequities around the world today between the haves and the have-nots. We'll stifle economic development and we'll threaten peace. And we will certainly threaten human health, as I've already mentioned. So we have had for a number of years now, in fact, decades, the, the United Nations conventions and agreements to deal with those issues. What, what is the status? What is the current status of the international uh, uh, effort? Yeah, it's a very good point. And unfortunately, it's, a good, it's not a good status. What is the current agreement on climate change the paris agreement it's an excellent agreement in some ways it says we meet we need to limit human induced climate change to less than two degrees celsius in the next century and actually try and aim at only 1.5 degrees celsius countries have to review their commitments every five years it talks about adapting to climate change and a very important part it talks about financing to developing countries for both mitigation and climate change. As I've already said, most of the damage has been done by industrialized countries, but all countries will have to mitigate and to adapt, and therefore developing countries need some technological assistance and financial assistance. The next slide then shows you where are we. If we want to reach a 1.5 degree world, we need to reduce global emissions between now and 2030 by 45 to 50 percent and be at net zero by 2050. If we're willing to only limit it to two degrees Celsius, we still have to reduce global emissions between now and 20 by at least 25 percent and be net zero by 2070. Well, what are the current pledges? Well, the pledges that were made before and at Glasgow at COP27, if anything, and you implement all of those pledges, emissions in 2030 could actually be higher in 2030 than today. Not 25% less, 
or 50 percent less so we have a, a huge emissions gap and in fact what the analysis is while we have some fairly good pledges which are in the right direction we don't have the policies to back them up many countries have made pledges for that for example the united kingdom but at this moment in time the policies that they have will not support the pledges so we have a major emissions gap to get to the Paris Agreement of 1.5 or 2. And we're currently on a pathway well above 2. I would say we're on a pathway of 2.5 to 3 degrees Celsius, and we're likely to pass the 1.5 target in the decade of the 2030s. Actually, it just says this. Probably pass the 1.5 in the 2030s, and we'll probably pass 2 degrees between 2050 and 2070 unless we have a significant strengthening of the pledges of both developed and developing countries. Yeah, I'm not going to go through this in detail. This simply says we need all countries. Uh, many have made pledges, but China and India, they've talked about changing carbon intensity, but their actual emissions of greenhouse gases are likely to go up due to economic growth between now and 2030. A whole bunch of countries said they'd phase out coal. But the biggest coal producers, India, China, US and Australia, did not sign up to that particular agreement. So it, it, even the US with President Biden and the recent infrastructure bill, even if it's fully implemented, will only reduce US emissions by 40%. And we really need all developed countries to reduce emissions by 60 percent uh, by 2030 and developing countries have got to reduce in that same time frame as well uh, deforestation needs to stop by 2030 but we've just seen in brazil in the last two years the rate of deforestation is significantly greater than the previous eight years so we're going in the wrong direction in many many places and the promised financing some of it is there but it's not coming online quickly this just says how well did we do on the so-called biodiversity aichi targets there were 20 targets that you can see on the left and there were two analyses one was called it best and one was called global biodiversity outlook to simplify this slide if you some see something in green it probably means that we achieved that target in 2020 well, there's only a couple of green blobs. If it's yellow, we made progress, but we did not meet the target in 2020. If you see red, it means we actually probably didn't make any progress. And if you see purple, we went backwards. We were worse in 2020 than we were in 2010. So none of the Aichi targets were fully met in either developed or developing countries and what you can see is a lot of red on that side so yes some progress has been made and we should applaud that that's the yellow but boy we've got a long long way to go and therefore the post 2020 negotiations on biodiversity under the convention on biodiversity really need to strengthen the commitments and what we need are not just goals and targets we need commitments we need actions that are monitorable. If we want to deal with biodiversity, and we can, we need to conserve and restore biodiversity. Protected areas is one place, but we have to integrate biodiversity into our agricultural system, our forestry system, into our fisheries. We then need to deal for the five threats that I've already talked about, land and sea use change, exploitation, climate change, pollution, and invasive alien species and we need to move aggressively forward on a circular economy sustainable production sustainable consumption and reduce consumption we need to do all of them it's not one or other it's all of them together well it it, it sounds like all these uh, huge issues that you are referring to uh, will not yield to anything but the unprecedented global international <laughs> collaboration. Uh, so what, what, what can we think about the 
response options that we have? What are the roles of the different stakeholders? And what is needed from the conventions, the UN and those mechanisms that are in place? Sure. And we can get there. We need to stop, stop transforming our land and sea, stop deforestation, eliminate the conversion of grasslands and wetlands. We need to have sustainable agriculture, sustainable fishery. We need to limit climate change. We need to limit ocean acidification. We have to reduce air, water and land uh, pollution. We have to reduce the use of our agricultural chemicals and plastics. We need to work with nature, not work against nature. We need to reduce invasive alien species. And a crucial issue, we need to eliminate subsidies in agriculture, forestry, because both of those encourage the use of fossil fuels. And we have to incorporate natural capital in decision making. We need to acknowledge that the value of nature. Okay, so what this simply says, and you saw this slide at the beginning, we need to transform our relationship with nature. We need to become sustainable. We need major shifts in investment and regulation. Uh, and if we can do that, they will be the key to a just and informed transformation. We need to overcome the inertia and opposition of vested interest. There are many in the private sector. There are many in some governments that actually are wedded to the status quo. They don't want to change. They want cheap energy, they want cheap food, and they're willing to be unsustainable. We have to make sure that all of the issues are addressed together. And therefore, and I'll, next slide, well, I think, believe we'll talk about, we need to actually change our economic, financial, and productive systems. GDP measures economic growth, but not sustainable economic growth. We need to include natural capital within inclusive wealth. And the inclusive wealth is the sum of built capital, human capital, and natural capital. And you also have to consider social capital. So we need to, when we need to think about economic growth, we need sustainable economic growth, and we need to consider inclusive wealth along with GDP. We need to eliminate environmental subsidies, not only in agriculture, but energy, in all energy, transportation, and fisheries embrace a circular economy and save those monies but, and invest them in a transition to a sustainable world. Um, we need our food, water and energy system. They're not independent in the same way climate, biodiversity, pollution and land degradation interact with each other. The food, water, energy systems interact with each other. So we need an integrated productive systems, basically. And as I've already said, if we can uh, get rid of many of these direct and indirect subsidies, they can actually fund the transition to a more sustainable world. And I won't go into details. This simply says we can become much more sustainable in the way we produce and use food. And we can become much more sustainable with our water system. And what we need to do is not only you have better policies, better technologies, we can actually move to more healthy diets. They're good for us from a health perspective. And we can actually, so I'm not saying become vegetarian or vegan, but have a more balanced diet uh, between that meat, fish, vegetables, and fruit. We need to reduce food waste. We waste, we waste 30% of the food in the world today. Uh, we can also, uh, eliminate waste of water significantly. But we need to put price on water. We need to make sure that every person in the world has a certain amount of water for their basic human needs. But as you go above basic human needs, we need to put a price on water so that we actually can eliminate or at least minimize the wastage of water. This simply says it addresses COVID and uh, pandemics. 75% of all new infectious diseases for humans have their origin in animals. There are potentially up to 700,000 viruses in animals that could, and I say could, pose a threat to human health. So what do we need to do? We need to have a holistic One Health approach where we look at human health, animal health, plant health, environmental health, 
altogether. We need to have wet markets in both developed and developing countries that are much healthier, much higher hygienic standards. We actually have to decrease deforestation, which puts humans and our livestock in interactions with wild animals. And so there are two ways we humans can become infected. One is by directly interacting with a wild animal that has uh, got a virus. And the other one is the virus could pass from a wild animal to livestock to us. So we need to actually be very careful on actually trying to minimize the threat of future pandemics. This simply says we're all in this together. This isn't just a role for governments or for international organization or financial organizations, the private sector, NGOs, individual, or the science community. We all have a role to play. We can all address these emergencies. We all have a role in transforming the economic and financials. We all have a role in transforming food, water, and energy. All of us, whether it's an individual, a government or an international organization, we all have to play our role. And I won't go, uh, says we also need to transform environmental governments. We need to strengthen the science policy interface, strengthen the international assessment, make them work together. We need to fund more transdisciplinary research. I've already said it, we need to align the goals, targets, or obligations of all of these policy instruments all of the SDGs, all of the environmental agreement. We need to make sure the funding and the capacity building is there. We need to strengthen the UN system. It's a fairly fragmented system. They all have to work together. Every UN agency has a role. And we need to increase the participation of marginalized and disenfranchised people, youth movements, uh, citizens' assembly. So we need a more polycentric governance structure and i won't again go into great detail governments must take the lead but as i've just said they also need everybody else to play their role so governments have got to help us meet the paris targets got to help meet uh, the post 2020 biodiversity they can lead the change with policies legislation and financing they can take the lead in transforming economic financial system, change the subsidy system, change the financing system, put on things like carbon taxes, carbon prices, markets for carbon trading, payment for ecosystem services. They can also put the right policies together on food, energy, and water. So they all work together. So governments can play a crucial role in policies, uh, stimulating technologies, stimulating research. So what do we need? And I, I have similar slides, but not shown them. For what can the private sector do? What can the finance sector do? What can we as individuals do? What can NGOs do? What should the science community do? So what do we need in the two COPs, COP27 and COP15? Uh, I believe COP20 is the last time to have any hope of achieving the Paris targets. All of the pledges, developed and developing countries, must be significantly strengthened. And I don't mean slightly strengthened, significantly strengthened. And the key is not just talking about net zero in 2050. The key issue is reducing our emissions now by 50% between now and 2030. That's the only way to get to net zero by 2050. We need to start with real actions, not just goals and targets. How will we get those goals? And what will you do to transform your economic financing and private sectors, especially in energy and agriculture? So all of these actions have got to be, have got to be backed up by monitoring, and I mean monitorable action. We need to check that governments are doing the right thing, that the private sector is doing the right thing that we as individuals are doing the right thing. Check that the policies, financing, technology, and behavior changes are there. And clearly we have to, as I've already said, help finance developing countries. In COP15, I think it's again the last chance to significantly conserve and restore biodiversity. We need very similar to energy, monitorable goals globally and nationally. 
the pledges must be accompanied by action. What will they do to reach these pledges? And again, finances is crucial. And last, I think it's last but not least, uh, much of this is discussed in the paper, Making Peace with Nature. So we're in a world where we're on a pathway that is unsustainable, but we can and we must act. All of us must act. And with that, we could become much more sustainable in the future. Thank you. Let, let me uh, uh, bring up a couple of uh, uh, questions to following this up. Um, one is the issue of the interconnection between those different issues and the fact that we have separate discrete conventions, the biodiversity, the combat desertification, the climate change. Uh, are you implying that we could do well with some kind of a super convention that will integrate all of those together and will connect the issues and will uh, produce the policies and the implications in one through one vehicle? Is that possible? Is that in an ideal world? You could answer yes, but we're not in an ideal world. I think we have to go step by step. And I think we need to get some common policies, common work programs across the conventions. In other words, when they start to develop policies in climate change, think about what the intended or unintended consequences might be for biodiversity or land degradation. But it all starts at the national level. We have, if we've got the international levels fragmented, we're even more fragmented at the national. We have departments of energy, departments of water, departments of agriculture, departments of transportation, departments for cities, departments for health. So the first place to start is when you put national policies together for economic growth, when you put a national policy together on energy or on agriculture, how do these policies play together? How will an energy policy and a food policy play? How will either or both affect climate or biodiversity? So the first place is to start, I would argue, at the national level and break down the barriers that we have in between departments in national government and then carry that philosophy forward to the international level. And it's not just combining the international assessment, but with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So yeah, I'm not asking for a super convention. It will, never, it will not happen, uh, but I am asking for more coordination. But that leads to the next question, which is not an easy one. Uh, you know, on the one hand, we see how we are not meeting, looking at those trends. We are not really meeting many of those targets. And in many cases, we are falling behind. And yet we have all this list of we must, we must do this, we must do that. Uh, how, how will that be connected? What, what is not there? that is needed in order to make that major, major transformation, that major shift? I think we have to, until there is self-interest, and that is self-interest at the individual level, at the national level, and at the global level, it's in our individual and collective self-interest that the cost of inaction exceeds the cost of action, and the world we're moving on will become less and less, inhabit less, and less inhabitable unless we act. And therefore, Stern many years ago, talked, Nick Stern talked about the cost of inaction was much greater than the cost of action in climate change. It's even more true today. The cost of renewable energy has come down tremendously. The cost of battery technology has come down tremendously. If we can scale up electric cars rather than fossil fuel cars, that will be a step in the right direction. Uh, when people realize that destroying nature is costing us money to destroy nature, not save much. So I think self-interest, and so we need to demonstrate more and more, we need to recognize we're moving on an unsustainable pathway and that action is actually cheaper than inaction. And actually at the convention level, they've realized this. They've talked about the Paris targets. They've talked about the Aichi targets, now negotiating, but they then talk about it with rhetoric, but they're failing to follow through. 
but also we need the private sector to work hand in glove and the financial sector hand in glove. And actually some of the private sector are ahead of governments because they see it's self-interest. So hopefully we will start to move in the direction of recognizing these issues uh, of self-interest at the individual, national and global level. So let, let me have one more question before we turn it and open it to the audience. Uh, if you were, if you, Bob, were to lead action uh, around the world, what would be the first priority that you'll focus on? Modifying the economic and financing system. Uh, I would get rid of the perverse subsidies, um, which is the direct subsidies, uh, probably over a over trillion dollars a year. That trillion dollars a year could be used to sustain, uh, to uh, fund incentives for sustainable technologies. I would actually internalize externalities. The International Monetary Fund believe there's about $5 trillion a year of subsidies, direct and indirect, mostly indirect in the energy system. If you internalize those externalities, renewable energy, end use efficiency, you clearly wouldn't be using fossil fuel anymore. Um, I would get the finance system to stop funding fossil fuel, stop funding unsustainable agriculture. So I would actually transform uh, the economic and finance systems. Thank you so much, Bob. This was really an incredible session that we have today. Uh, a lot to think about, a lot to do as well. So thank you for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for coming, for joining us. Uh, as you know, we reignited the conversation series. We have a number of very uh, fascinating topics to explore in the next few months, and I hope you'll all join us. Thank you, Bob, again. Sure. Talk soon. It was lovely to see you, lovely to be with you, and lovely to hear you. Bye. It was a pleasure. Thank you.